Hi, my name is Beth Lewis, and today we're going to talk about how to organize your divorce. Hi, my name is Beth Lewis, and I'm the president and founder of Positive Solutions Divorce Services, where we help couples that are going through separation and divorce save unnecessary legal fees and guide them step by step through the divorce process. Today, I'm very happy to have a special guest with me, De uh, Debbie Sean, and Debbie is a divorce organizer, and we're going to talk about how to organize for a divorce. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me today. Yes, absolutely. So tell me what you do, because this is very interesting for not only people like myself as a mediator, but mm -hmm. other professions such as lawyers and um, financial specialists help help us to understand what you do. Well, I think as you quite well know, divorce is an overwhelming process. And one of the things that people very quickly learn is it's not only a full-time job, but there's a tremendous amount of paperwork. And there's a, an yes, expectation there of gathering all kinds of things. And then what do you do with it? So for a lot of people, first of all, even realizing what documents they need and how to find it can sort of take them over the top. And then they've got it all, and it's just in piles everywhere. So a lot of what I work with people on is not only learning how to locate what they need, but then what do you do with it? For example, how do you set up a filing system? How do you keep things organized? So that if you're in a situation, whether you're in mediation, you're working with lawyers, and you have to produce a document, there's a discussion about something, do you want to spend 10 minutes while everybody searches through the mounds of paper? Or you've got your nice little, what I call for every client, their divorce box, a nice portable file box. In there, they've got their file folders, they can pull it out quickly. And it's a way for people also, who may never have taken on this role in the marriage, may not have had this information, now they're gonna be on their own. They're gonna to have to know whether it's paying bills, locating your stuff, how to do it, how to find it, what to do with it. So it's pretty empowering when you realize that you've gone from completely overwhelmed, like how am I going to deal with this, to, oh, actually I know what to do and how to find this. So Debbie, can you give us um, two tips on what you would recommend for somebody that is overwhelmed with this process? I think the most important thing is to try and compartmentalize it. Don't assume you're going to get it all done at once and it's all going to happen because even if you approach it that way, odds are good you're not going to start because you're going to say, oh my God, I can't possibly get this all done, so I'm just going to do nothing. So one of the things that I suggest to people is book a half an hour. Either take your checklist or your information about what somebody wants, set a timer, and start working your way through. And at a half an hour, stop. Because that gives people sort of a time-limited process. They know they can get something done and the next day you can proceed. And if they're feeling great at the end of the half hour, they want to go another half hour, but you're not looking at it thinking, oh, this is going to be 12 hours, so I just won't start. And I think the other tip is it's important to have one contained area where you put the information as you find it in a format that you'll find it again. So you've got a box, you've got file folders. If you want to label it bank account, you want to label it TD account number, blah, blah, blah. You want to name it just the number. It doesn't matter as long as it works for you. There's no right way and there's no wrong way. There's just a way that makes sense for you if you need to find it again. And I think those are good beginning ways to get started. But for anybody who thinks they're going to sit down and get it all done at once, odds are good you just won't start. It's just too hard. And what a way for clients to save money. Oh, huge. Because if they're rely relying on their lawyers to help them to do this, mm -hmm. they are they are spending so much in legal fees that they really don't have to spend. Absolutely. My yeah. my sorry, my favorite clients that come in to mediation are mm -hmm. the ones that are organized. They have a folder, they have all of their income information, they have all of their assets, all of their liabilities, mm -hmm. statements of all of those things. They're all organized, and it's so easy for us just to say, okay, this is this, we're going to put it in here. This is this, we're going to put it in mm -hmm. here. Um, the, the ones that I 
dread walking through the door are the ones that walk in with their banker's box full of documents and say, here you go, you fill it, you figure it out. <laughs> or a plastic shopping bag filled with them. Or a plastic them. shopping bag, yes. But I think the other part of it is it puts you in a position where as a trained mediator, you can be helpful to the clients doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's right. And the same if you're seeing a lawyer. Do you really want to pay a lawyer to have to go through all this stuff? I've never met a mediator or a lawyer who said thank you when the, a pile of stuff was dumped in front of them, exactly That's as right. you describe. Because you have a specific skill set that you want to be able to immediately get to work on with these people. It's in their interest, and it also, you know, as you said, it makes life easier for you. So what kinds of documents do you help clients prepare? Well, so the first thing that I have is I have developed a couple of checklists because I think that especially when you're feeling overwhelmed, there's nothing better than being able to look at something and mark off, oh my goodness, I actually was able to get something done. So in terms of financial documents, I can help them do a draft of their financial statement, whether it's a 13 or a 13-1 which is the basis for everything, as we know, in family law in Ontario. So let's just explain that because some of our viewer, viewers won't know what that is. So the Form 13 and 13-1 are the financial statements that your lawyer is going to require from you Absolutely. when you go to see them in a family law case. Yes, yes. because and if you are... don't have your financial disclosure done properly, then nothing else can happen. That's right. Because, of course, what people are worried about, they're worried about their children and they're worried about their money. And in order to make any of the ongoing decisions around either of those things, Family Law in Ontario states you've got to have your financial disclosure. Right. And one of the ways that I work with people is I go to their homes. Because for most people, if they can already begin to gather things up and take them somewhere, they have some kind of a format for it. But some people don't even know what's in that filing cabinet. How do I find this stuff? I mean, often it's not possible. They may still be cohabiting. They don't want to meet in their home. We work around it. But I think that from most of the referrals that I get, whether it's from family lawyers or from professional people, will be people that they just don't really know where to begin. You know, there's a certain group of people who've handled this throughout their marriage. They're that party. They know exactly what to do. And as you and I both know, it's a complicated form, even at the best of times. If you know what you're doing, if you've never handled it, it can be quite yes, nightmarish. Yes, those documents are very overwhelming for people. So um, we start by setting up a system to gather what are the documents you have to find, how do you find them, now where do you put them so that when you need them again, you can find them easily. Um, I have things like agenda templates to help people, you know, you're scattered. You know, people will say, I went into the office, I knew what I had to talk to my lawyer about. I forgot half of it by the time I hit the parking lot, and that's when I remembered the important question that I never did get to ask. Right. So I have them put it in writing, make an agenda. Uh, I suggest they discuss with their lawyer, maybe email it to them ahead of time. So everybody knows what your agenda is. Theirs may be different. You bring the two together. And, and my... That's that's a wonderful way again of saving money absolutely because the more time you spend with your lawyer absolutely trying to if you go in with an agenda and you know what you're going to be talking about mm -hmm. you get everything taken off your list but if you don't go in with an agenda and you forget something then you're going to be emailing them or calling them at a different at a different time mm -hmm. and they're going to hit their their little start button and they're going to charge yeah. you for those individual emails and phone calls. That's right. And it also helps you as a client to feel more organized. The other thing, uh, the template that I have, there's room for discussion. You can make notes as you're going. And there's the really important right hand side which says who's responsible for the follow up. And I've had so many lawyers who said to me, you know, it's so expensive, these clients who call them and say, you're not doing anything. Why aren't you working on my behalf? And they have to say to them, I'm waiting for you to produce, you know, A, B, and C. I've been waiting and waiting. This way, at the end of a meeting, everybody's clear who's supposed to be doing what. Right. And there's a way for the client. And I think especially for clients to help them remember and stay on track. Because it is so much. The learning curve is steep. It's all new to you. And, and extremely overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Yeah, and and as you've said, it's absolutely very costly. And this is a way that, you know, people have the opportunity to kind of consolidate and to use 
that one hour, whatever it's costing them, as efficiently as possible. Um, but, you know, I think your point about emails and, uh, and phone calls is well taken. I have clients and I'll say to them, if you need to email your lawyer every day, do your email. Put it in drafts. Once a week, open that. You'll see odds are excellent. You've resolved at least two of the things on your own. One of them is irrelevant. And the two you really need advice on, you're now sending one email yes. rather than the five. Right. You know, yes. so you're saving money. And also, you know, as professionals, people want to know that the client they're working with respects their time also. Right. And I want to touch on one more thing because I think this is this is probably the most important for people that are going through separation is empowerment mm -hmm. because once they have this information and they have it all together and they're able to walk confidently into a lawyer's office or into mediation or into even a courtroom if they have to um, mm -hmm. they're going to be they're going to feel very empowered by having all of this information and having all of these documents prepared ahead of time and understanding them and understanding them, yes, it's it's going to give them a sense of, wow, I, you know, th this this is awesome. I'm doing this, and maybe mm -hmm. the other party isn't as as uh, prepared, um, and so it makes them look really good. Well, and it makes them feel good, so that, you know, if you talk about somebody who drops off, you know, that box on a lawyer's desk and says it must be in there, deal with it. Yeah. And then they go into a meeting or a mediation or, as you said, we hope not, but people do end up in court. All of a sudden, the contents of this box are in front of them, but they still don't really know what it is and how it's been put together. Somebody who works with me, we do this together. So yes. that it may be something uh, as important for somebody as saying, here's your investment statement. Do you know how to read it? Mm -hmm. right. So before it goes into the file folder, we can talk about that because the truth is, People going through this process are not stupid. No. They feel that they are often. But it may just be that they're now being asked to take on a task they never had to do before. That's right. You know, and, right. and part of what I help people to understand is that there's a learning curve. You can learn this stuff. Absolutely. I, I really hope that, um, that more people are, are able to, to find out about what you do and, and um, are able to use your services. Well, thank you very much, You're Beth. very welcome. Thanks for coming in. All right. <laughs>